We are live now. If a child has difficulty with forming specific words or say some sounds incorrectly, get stuck or has difficulty with smooth flow of words or sentences, has a delay in language development, or if he does not understand what others say, has difficulty communicating his her thoughts using language, has difficulty in reading or writing, you must consult a speech and language pathologist at the earliest because these challenges can make it particularly hard for a child to succeed in school. Properly diagnosing a child's disorder is crucial so that each child can get the right kind of help. Good evening. I'm Minakshi Vadera, an audiologist and speech language pathologist. And on behalf of Indian Speech and Hearing Association, I welcome you again to another informative session of Speech and Hearing Awareness Annuals 2020. The sole purpose of these annuals is to make people aware about what are the various kinds of speech, language, or hearing problems and how they can get best possible help. But before we start today's session, I would invite Dr. Praveen Kumar, the Chair of Publications of Indian Speech and Hearing Association, to say a few words. Good evening, madam. Good evening, all the panelists for today's discussion on uh, communication in autism. Uh, I just wanted to brief you all, uh, all the participants and attendees uh, about uh, the association, Indian Speech and Hearing Association, which uh, came into the existence in the year of 1966. And uh, the formation of ISHA, that is Indian Speech and Hearing Association, was formulated finally on 15th December 1967. And uh, uh, just to brief you all about uh, our organization uh, at the national level, that ISHA is registered under the Mysore Society's Registration Act 1960, that is Mysore Act number 17 of 1960, on 15th December 1967. And from that day to till date, we had a long journey, but then still we have a lot more to achieve uh, you know, professionally and uh, for what we are you know, uh, looking for and our professionals or the stakeholders, and they are speech language pathologists, audiologists, speech language and hearing scientists, both in India as well as those who are there uh, globally. ISA uh, wanted to have professional excellence in speech language and hearing services. At the same time, safeguarding professional ethics and the interest of professionals and the people with the speech, language, and hearing disorders. And in that regards, uh, this particular uh, speech and hearing awareness annals, this 2020 is uh, organized to make our stakeholders as well as professionals to be aware of the services what we rendered uh, nationally as well as internationally. Uh, I'm very thankful to uh, our, all the ISHI colleague, uh, colleague in ISHI members, as well as my parent institute, All India Institute of Speech and Hearing, where I'm serving as an associate professor and currently heading the Department of Audiology uh, from January 2020. With this few words, i handing over my, uh, uh, talk to panelists and Madam Minakshi to take further. At the same time, I wish all the best to all the panelists and uh, all the attendees. Thank you very much. Thank Minakshi, you, sir. Madam, over to you. Thank you, sir, for uh, the information. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Uh, Yesterday, we attended a very nice seminar on spinning. And if you missed it, you can still watch it on our YouTube channel, uh, Isha, Annual, Isha Annuals. And uh, 
tomorrow also we have yet another very exciting session plan on genetics of communication disorder but today we are talking about a very exciting session interesting session on communication in autism the word autism haunts many people around the world and when a parent hears it for the first time it brings so many emotions but autism is just a part of child it's not everything he is and a child is so much more than a diagnosis these kids see the world from a different angle and through div, you know how howsoever devastating at first autism is in the end of the world it is the beginning of a whole new one with this we would like to start a panel which is being moderated by professor pratibha karan he she actually doesn't require any introduction she is the authority on autism in our country she has uh, the expertise she has guided a lot of people she has helped many with autism and she is the founder director of comdeal trust for uh, introducing our uh, panelists i would request garima Garima. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Our first panelist is Dr. Preeja Balan. She has 20 plus experience uh, of in the profession of speech and language pathology. She has ex expertise in AACs and she's been implementing it in special schools as well as in regular schools. She's been conducting early intervention programs through Comdeal and inclusive education programs in preschools. She has contributed towards a website for voice output communication aid. She has been already doing a lot of awareness and training programs. She's co-founder of Octave Hearing Clinic. Dr. Deepa Bhatnaya, she's head in uh, DNB Comdeal Mumbai, which is in multidisciplinary center. She's certified in Comdeal program and also Hanan. And she's been uh, developing uh, training manuals for the parents. Uh, on a lot of uh, topics and she's also produced a video uh, which uh, to help parents about pre-learning skills. She's uh, finished her master's and bachelor's from India, different universities. Dr. Lex Lakshmi Venkatesh is our next panelist. She's a professor at Sri Ramchandra Institute of Higher Education and Research. She's a, uh, she's a senior consultant in speech language pathology. She's finished her studies from AYJ, Aish, and Washington, Seattle. She has 15 plus years of experience in uh, this profession. She has special interest in early intervention programs. Dr. Mili Matthew is our next panelist. She received her PhD from Mysore, completed her postdoctoral from Australia. She is currently chair of Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders and an assistant professor at Minnesota. She has also contributed a lot of research products, pro projects. Dr. Shivani Tiwari, she's a speech language pathologist from, as a profession. She's uh, currently working as an associate professor in Manipal. She has completed her uh, studies also from Manipal and Aish. She has 15 years plus experience and her areas of research are child language di disorders and development. Our next panelist is Dr. Mira Esses. She's also an assistant professor at Department of Speech Pathology and Audiology at Nimhans Bangalore. She's a part of multidisciplinary team and she works with autism and other development disorders. She has her areas of interest as early intervention. She, she has also contributed in a lot of research product, uh, pro projects. Uh, next panelist is Dr. Nirupama Shrikant. She's a consultant in Center for Advanced Research and Excellence in Autism uh, at Bangalore. She has an experience of 22 years and she's also keen interest, uh, she has also keen interest in child language disorders. So over to you, Minakshima. Thank you. Thank you. So I would hand over uh, the mic to Dr. Pratibha Karan for moderating the session. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to begin on behalf of the panel to congr by congratulating uh, Isha and the organizers of the series of webinars on different aspects of the services provided by speech language pathologists. It is indeed commendable and I, I am witnessed the extraordinary effort that you people have uh, put into it. I'm sure it'll bring in rich dividends. 
both to the members of Isha as well as to the larger public which needs our services. Uh, congratulations and I, I wish you will continue to contribute to the discipline uh, in as extensive a manner in the future too. Our topic for today is a very um, unique one in the sense that it's not something that a lot of people are familiar with. That is the role of the speech language pathologist in the management of those diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders. And you know there are reasons for this, which I will go into. Uh, along with me, we have a very distinguished panel of young committed speech language pathologists, uh, all of them from the uh, soft agenda, all of them with sound academic backgrounds, passionately committed um, to their work and wanting to make a difference. And I'm sure that this will come across when you listen to your, their presentations. We are trying to cover as many aspects of this disorder and the role of communication in this disorder. Uh, we have had one omission which we would have liked to cover, which is the auditory processing issues. Unfortunately, we did not find a suitable speaker for that subtopic. But apart from that, I think the panel brings in expertise in very many different aspects of the management of communication disorders in those with ASD. What I will do is I will begin with an overview of uh, how speech language pathologists came to be involved in this disorder and what their role is. And then we will go on to speak about, uh, share the uh, forum with the individual speakers who will cover different aspects of the disorder. But before we do that, we will also have uh, video clippings from stakeholders, families, parents, brothers, uncles, who have witnessed what it is to have somebody in the family grow up with autism. So we'd like to uh, get you to listen to them also so that you, you know the complexity of life with autism spectrum disorders, yet it's not without its very positive side too. So let me just over the next 10 minutes give you a brief overview of how SLPs got to be involved in autism spectrum disorders. As many of you all are probably aware, the description of autism was first given sometime in the 1940s. And we've come a long way, 80 years is a long time, but we still do not know what causes autism, what is the specific cause of autism, though of course our understanding of the causation has changed over the last 80 years. From the 1940s, uh, to, to, to date, what has remained constant is that there is a triad of disturbances in those who are diagnosed with autism. And this triad includes uh, the behavior, which was first noticed and documented, the um, lack of social interest or social aloofness, and the strangeness of the communication in, in these um, individuals who are diagnosed with autism. So this triad of symptoms has remained constant over the last 80 years. But the interpretation of why the individuals diagnosed with autism have these differences has changed dramatically since it was first identified in 1940. From about the 40s to the 70s uh, or so, uh, autism was seen primarily as a behavioral disorder, as a mental health issue. And regrettably, a lot of blame was placed on the mothers, saying that it was the mother's personality which caused the social aloofness and uh, the, the lack of interest in communication and the odd behavior that was seen in these children. That has changed. And from the 1970s onwards, increasingly, uh, the interpretation has moved towards a biologically caused disorder where the child uh, seems to have, for no apparent reason, odd behaviors, uh, differences in their communication, and a social aloofness. So that remained. So from the 1970s up to the year, you know, around uh, the turn of the century, uh, these were clubbed under a larger umbrella of pervasive developmental disorders. 
you will notice the word developmental has come into the diagnosis, which made a shift from a mental health psychologically caused disorder to a biologically based developmental disorder. And of course, since the um, turn of the century, we are now using the term autism spectrum disorders. But until the turn of the century, until the year 2000, SLPs were hardly recognized as people who had anything to do with autism. And this is because the communication issues were seen as being secondary to some other issue. And, and that is why SLPs were not involved. However, there have been SLPs across the world who have been working with other children with uh, developmental communication disorders, neurodevelopmental disorders. There too, the labels have changed. In the 1960s, 70s, you know, we were taught about uh, developmental dysphasia. We were taught about minimal brain damage. But by the 70s, 80s, those terms were dropped largely because there was no proof of brain damage in these children and people uh, objected to the use of uh, 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 brain damage in, in the diagnostic term. But then we got a new set of descriptive words, diagnostic terms like specific language impairment, pragmatic language impairment, semantic pragmatic disorders. These I'm talking about the uh, speech language pathologists. On the other hand, there were the terms of pervasive developmental disorders being used by child psychiatrists, psychologists, educators, etc. What happened during those years is that because of the overlap between these two large groups, speech pathologists did end up working with some of these children. You know, the diagnosis was never a, a hundred percent yes or no, because there are no biological markers on which it is uh, based. It is based largely on observation and uh, uh, looking at the behavior and assessing them with some very uh, superficial tools. There was no basic biological marker as in the other disorders. And when the SLPs you know, worked with these children, they obviously used their training, uh, which they had got from the SLP discipline and found positive changes in the children. And that is how SLPs began to be involved. This happened across the world. We, uh, you know, the, the work that went into the Comdeal model happened in the 80s, 90s. Uh, similarly, there were uh, SLPs like uh, um, Barry Prezant, Amy Weatherby in the United States, or there were people like you know, the Hannon Group, which was working with um, uh, children who had SLI and such other diagnostic terms, who then moved into autism spectrum disorder largely because there's this overlap. There were researchers like uh, Dr. Dorothy Bishop in Oxford who, who talked about this overlap between SLI and autism spectrum disorders. Their communication was included in, in intervention procedures such as PATH and PASS. So across the world, simultaneously, people were recognizing that the communication issues in autism spectrum disorders was a genuine issue. It was not that the children did not communicate because they did not want to communicate, but they had genuine communication issues and SLPs are trained to address these issues. And that is how uh, SLPs got involved. From the year 2000 onwards, there are these very well-documented intervention models. We have Comdeal here in India. We have the CERTS model by Prezant and Weatherby. Uh, we have the Hannon model now for um, autism intervention. And as I mentioned, path and pass. So this is the history. And the, um, uh, the more our involvement, the greater our involvement, the more we are picking up the many aspects of the communication disorders, which are genuinely faced by the child, and we are beginning to address them. And that is making a difference. And that is how we've come to play a fairly important role. Uh, of course, along with a team of other experts, other specialists, we don't do this in isolation. And it is making significant contributions to the well being of those with autism. And this is what my fellow colleagues will be talking about. Uh, we will go through it hierarchically, right from the initial phases, what we need to do, where is the disturbance, how is it addressed, and then go on to very many different aspects of communication per se. But please remember, this is not the end of the interpretation. It is in fact, the very beginning. 
There is much that we have to learn about what is the speech pathologist's role in helping a child with autism spectrum disorder. And these insights are just coming, they're being documented, they're being studied, but I think the future holds good for this relationship between SLPs and autism spectrum disorders. So this is the background. Uh, we will begin now with the family perspectives. Uh, Minakshi, if we could have um, the video clipping from Ms. Bhuvana. Minakshi? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Bhuvana. Thank you, Isha, for giving me the opportunity to be on this webinar. I'm a parent of a five and a half year old, especially able boy. Today, I'm going to share with you um, my journey. No, I think we have a different one, Minakshi. It's not bonus. Ma'am, uh, uh, we had this. We, I got this one. So you can you share it on your screen, ma'am? Yeah, let me do that. Then just give me a minute. Can you get uh, any of the others, if not hers? Like... Yeah, I got three. Yeah. Uh, bonus, try again first. That was hers. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Bona. Thank yeah. you for giving me the opportunity to be on this webinar. I'm a parent of a five and a half year old, especially a little boy. Today, I'm going to sure you didn't share the screen. Sorry, uh, Meenakshi, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah. Give me a minute. Sorry. With audio sharing. Yeah. Yeah. I will do that. My name is Bhuvana. Thank you, Isha, for giving me the yes, opportunity sir. to be on this webinar. You don't see the screen. Yeah, audio. Share audio. Especially a little boy. Sorry, you didn't see this today. I'm going to share no, we can yes, screen it. Can see, but share the audio. Okay. Uh, sir, could you see the screen? Or we could... Yes, screen we can see. Sir, I shared the audio. Yeah. I share computer sound. Yeah. Wait, sir. I did that, sir. Um, it was audible. Hi, everyone. My name is Bhuvana. Thank you, Isha, for giving me the opportunity to be on this webinar. No, audio is I'm not. I'm a parent of a five and a half year old, especially able to... Anil, can you help on that? There is audio is not coming. Are the panelists in here or not? Uh, how we cope with it? Uh, Krishna, sir, it's audible. Krishna, sir. We can hear. His condition. Our son... Okay, that's fine. Hi, everyone. You don't see it? I don't see it on my screen. Giving me the opportunity to be on this webinar. I'm a parent of a five and a half year old, especially a little boy. Yes, Pratibha, ma'am, we can see. We can see the video. Okay, yeah. Please, and how we cope with it and what are we going to Please increase the respective volume of your uh, uh, systems to be louder. Uh, this milestone. Uh, perfectly up to the age of two, he crawled, walked at the right time. Yeah. After the age of two, we noticed oh, something. Technical different. glitches. Um, he didn't. Um, he didn't have any eye contact. Um, he didn't respond to name call. Um, any of contact. the three, if you can play with, you know, that, that's always, fine. Always cry. We could never go out anywhere. Sorry, ma'am. Any of the three, if you can play, we can start and and yeah. check out the others. Crying and we would just any of the three time. videos. In ten minutes. After we knew something was something was really really wrong. That's when we decided to get him diagnosed. Uh, we got him diagnosed. I don't see it. Uh, let me know. Can see it? Okay, what is the next step? Someone suggested us to... Yeah, we can see it. It's well, ma'am. That's visible. And get a full assessment. So we went to Comdiv. Uh, it was a grilling 
three and a half, four hours assessment. Um, they asked us all kinds of questions. Um, and then um, they told us to get him enrolled in the group program. So at Comgil, we spent two years at the early intervention program, uh, the toddler group and when he was two, and the preschool group when he was a three. So uh, what did they do at Comgil? Uh, how did, uh, what was the program all about? So it's a really... Would you like me to go on unless, you know, yeah. because I don't see the screen. I don't know whether participants are able to see it. Three aspects. Or, the peers, the yeah. Learning, yeah, here. Uh, maybe learning. we should just pause the video for a minute if you don't mind. Thanks, uh, Ma'am, we can hear it and see it, ma'am. And I can see a lot of panelists, also uh, participants saying that they can hear and see. Okay, yeah, please go ahead then. Yeah, okay. please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and cognitive thinking. Uh, then you have the OT, which is the physical training, which is the gross motor and the fine motor. And then you have the speech. Um, the total program was a parent-child uh, program, which was very nice because I could go along with him uh, and, and, you know, and see the therapist actually interact with the child and you know how they interacted, which, which, re which was really helpful. The main aspect, what we learned uh, uh, very early was um, stop trying to make the child to speak. Um, you need, they, 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 there were certain aspects which he had to cover before speech, you know. He had to have sitting tolerance. Uh, he had to be able to sit in one place and do simple activities. Um, you know, his gross motor, work on a gross motor because that was directly related to speech. Uh, the imitation written play, social skills. These are three aspects, uh, you know, which, which in normal autist, autistic children lack uh, the three main aspects of written play, imitation, and social interaction. So work on these. Unless these things are settled, um, speech uh, will not come. And speech is the last, last factor in, into this whole program. So, uh, so we did uh, the toddler group. Uh, at Combeal, and we did the preschool group at the age of three, where uh, our preschool uh, was for three hours, and uh, we uh, we saw remarkable progress uh, in our child uh, after the program. So um, um, early intervention is is key um, um, to help your child um, and you, uh, uh, you know, cope with the condition. Should I go ahead with the next one, ma'am? Yes, please. And then, you know, I will just speak about it briefly. Then we can start with the panelists. All right. Hey, my name is Nathan. Uh, we started going to uh, comedy when my son was 18 months old. Now he is uh, close to 10 years. Initially, uh, the reason why we went to comedy was because he had some communication delay. Uh, the verbal thing is not uh, coming out. When the non predominantly was on non-verbal communication mode. So uh, when we went to Comby, uh, they did a complete comprehensive di you know, analysis, and then we started out with an individual session. And uh, I think when he has uh, close to two years, uh, we moved to uh, the group sessions. So group session there were about seven or eight kids and uh, he really did well in the group sessions and uh, and mainly because you know he don't have siblings you know at home so it helped him really well uh, you know being with other kids and all that so in that perspective he gained a lot uh, in that group sessions. And after that, I think uh, we started the individual sessions again. Individual session is more of one-to-one -one session. Okay, that also helped him uh, in terms of you know, you know, bridging his gaps in communication. Right. So this is more. Uh, this this the whole strategy is to try to you know move him to the mainstream uh, schools. Right, so that uh, you know, when he goes to the mainstream school, there should not be any, any, any gap. Now, he is in um, fourth standard. Now, uh, of course, there are uh, few gaps you know, in terms of communication. Uh, but 
pretty much, uh, you know, I would say that whatever the, the initial early intervention we had from Pondy was really good and that helped him a lot. And then, uh, you know, moreover, they actually did counseling for us as well. So that, again, as a family, you know, we got benefited from uh, Pondy from that perspective. So, yeah, so that's it about the story about my son. Uh, thank you. My name is Matthew Belmonte. I'm brother and uncle to two people with autism. And in that sense, you could say that my experience with autism began the day I was born. I grew up amid a strange normal of headbanging, sleepless nights, routines, meltdowns, pecs, sign language, refrigerator locks, and special diets. My brother and I both were fascinated with predictable cause and effect. Raindrops patterning dry earth, springs hanging under furniture, rocking to the hum of the television transformer. That same need for order that made my brother autistic made me a scientist. The big difference was that I could speak. He couldn't. In spring 2011, I was a visiting professor at the National Brain Research Center in Haryana. When Dr. Pratibha spoke at NBRC, I found Kamdil's therapeutic work on prerequisite skills remarkably aligned with my and others' neuroscientific findings. We all were seeing that the differences most obvious, most debilitating, and most diagnostic of autism sprang from more fundamental differences in prerequisite skills. <laughs> Differences that could be addressed if we targeted them early in development. We collaborated on a Comdeal workshop in spring 2012, published our first paper with Comdeal in 2013, released therapeutic software developed at Comdeal, and we continue to work together. Innovative, dedicated science-based programs like Comdeal's are important because communication is fundamental. Without it, everything becomes harder, more frustrating. Whether it's by speech or sign or text or typing, we all deserve to share thoughts or simply to choose what we want to eat or what to wear. And although the public rhetoric of autism has been driven by people who can talk, about a quarter of people with autism speak few words or no words at all. We enable their silence and we can enable their voices. For their benefit and everyone's, these people must be accommodated, included, and given opportunities to learn. That's what Comdeal has shown. Our goal is a world where people with autism feel in charge of their senses, thoughts, feelings, and behavior. Over to you, ma'am. Um, so you have seen the different perspectives of the families, what they experience, and all of them emphasize the importance of communication. And, and this is where we come in. So let's begin with uh, our panel. As I mentioned, we will cover different aspects of the disorder, beginning with uh, early identification. And we have Dr. Meera, who will address this topic. Um, Meera, could you tell us why? Uh, I, I, my apologies. I think we should begin with the Nirupama Shrikanth. Um, is there any preference between the two of you all? Um, I could probably go for that. Yeah, okay, yeah. So we'll start with Mira, who will talk about early identification. What are the signs uh, that one can see in these children? What one should do about it? So Mira, could you tell us why, what is involved in early identification and why early identification is important? Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so just a 
quick sentence. So I think um, I can see from the audience, ma'am, that there's a very mixed group here. And um, we are kind of, get, this is a public awareness program and we are looking at uh, increasing awareness amongst the public, caregivers and parents. So a lot of what I'm talking is very fundamental and I'm happy to take more questions later on. But for today, my talk is very basic. And uh, with that, I'm going to start. So the first question, of course, uh, what Dr. Karant asked me was, what is early identification and detection, right? So like the term itself tells us, it is about identifying at the very earliest ages, uh, even as young as the as a one year, like the first birthday party, you must be able to identify that, hey, there's something not okay about my child. What is it? There's something that's concerning me. So we may, we may not be able to diagnose a child as young as that, like at, a, at the first birthday, but we certainly know from several reports that our parents have told us at NIMHANS, several places, I mean, research that you can identify concerns by the first birthday, even earlier than the first birthday. So I think early identification goes down really to the first year, to the latter part of the first year or early second year. Um, often in our country, I, I mean, um, there are, I mean, I don't have a statistic for this, but based off of our experience, the mean age for identification and then for a diagnosis and then for an intervention goes anywhere between four years to seven years, depending upon what socioeconomic strata a child and the family come from. So we are really trying to, you know, bring the age of detection uh, intervention to really like the first year. So with that, um, I would probably again quote from examples that you've seen and um, that our parents have told us in the clinic. So what is it that we should look for, right? So one of the first things that I want to tell you, hey, I do recollect, now that I think about it, my child was generally a lot quieter. He did not coo enough. He did not play with us. He just didn't produce enough sounds really early in the first year. He did not laugh. He did not actively smile at me when I carried him in my arms. These are early signs. These are signs to look out for parents. Do look out for these signs not enough vocal play, generally quiet, not smiling enough and not sharing happiness. Another example, my child did not point. He just would often cry. He would take me to that place or he would use my hand and just, just touch the, uh, let's say biscuit dabba and would then say, and then would cry again. So not pointing, that is an early sign, not pointing for what he wants. Another example of pointing, Often mothers carry their children and then they just go out onto the street and show them the chanda mama, the moon. They may show the cow on the street. And here there's a child who's busy engaging in something that he has seen or he's, he's with his own hands, fingers, but is not really sharing attention, looking at the chanda mama, looking at mama, enjoying food. So shared attention and ability to go back and forth, that's an early sign. Definitely at the first year, you will be able to identify these things. One another common thing that we hear, whenever I call my child, he just does not respond. She just does not respond to what I say. But if she does hear her father's Enfield, the sound of the Enfield, that sound, she just runs to the door. Here's her favorite advertisement. She runs to the TV room. So she can hear, but she can, she's not responding to when I call her name. She may be hearing, but she's not turning around and looking and sharing. So not being, not responding, no reciprocal response to name call, that is another early sign. So there are several such examples that I can quote from families whom we have seen. And I think parents, whoever, people who are on this call here, these are the early things that you have to look for in the first year of life. None of these may be enough to make a diagnosis of autism very early, but these are developmental concerns, developmental concerns. Other things include not using enough gestures, not imitating actions, just generally quiet, not enough motor activity. I mean, there are just a long list of things, but it's, I think about identifying, if you find that there is something, something tells you, your intuition tells you that something is not okay, you probably should not be waiting for a diagnosis. You should not wait and watch. You should not say, listen to people who would say, it'll come later, it's okay but really please reach out to professionals. Please reach out to professionals. Yeah, thank you, Mira. Could you tell us why it is important to reach out to professionals early? So here's the 
So um, I'll come back to who the professionals are, but uh, why should we reach out to professionals? Why? So the first few years of life mark the, the brain just the brain just goes through a very dynamic period in the first few years of life. Not only does it double in size, but it also there are several connections in the brain that strengthen that go the just that 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 first two years of life. That's why you should start early into you should start identifying early. And if you identify early, you will start intervention early. And when I say intervention, I'm talking about uh, I'll come to that point later on. But I'm but, but what I'm saying trying to say is. When you intervene in the first two years of life, you've identified and you're intervening in the first two, not first two years of life, first few years of life, it is the brain is able to, to kind of take everything in and respond to what you're telling the child and respond to intervention. And that's why I think it's important to identify early, maybe diagnose, maybe not diagnose, but actually intervene early. So that's yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mira. So I think Mira has very clearly emphasized why early identification is important because early intervention is important. And there's been an enormous amount of research on autism in the last 20 years, given the high incidence. The one thing that has stood the test of time is that early intervention makes a lifelong impact. And the earlier you start, the better the impact, the greater the chance the child has of remaining in mainstream society and maximizing his potential. And this is why early identification and early intervention are important. Right. Even uh, the professionals maybe, you know, again, uh, SLPs are not recognized as among the first professionals that uh, a, a family which is concerned about a child having uh, autism possibly uh, should consult, but there are the psychiatrists, there are the psychologists, there are the developmental neurologists. So there are a range of people. But given that there is so much happening in this discipline for parents and the general public, we would just like to suggest that don't run to the internet. Most parents do that. And the uh, information that is there is not all sifted clearly unless it is a scientific website and most families tend to get overwhelmed by the contradictory enormous amount of information that is there. So identify professionals who have been trained, who, are, who have experience in this topic and a commitment to this topic and do consult them. So once you identify a child, there are things that needs to be done. And I think Nirupama Shrikant will talk about the first few steps of what it is that we do with a child diagnosed with ASD. Thank you, Mira. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so I'll be talking about um, the prerequisite learning skills um, before we actually go on to talk about communication. So you, you've often heard that, um, in the, you know, in, when you visited an intervention center about prerequisite skills. So here we're referring to a whole set of readiness skills that a child needs before he learns to say his first word. And um, communication development depends on these skills. And when I talk of prerequisite skills, I'm talking about things like, uh, you know, um, jointly attending to an activity, um, giving eye contact to the adult or following the gaze. When I'm showing the child something, he's following the gaze with me. He's sitting along with me doing a task. Or, and he's complying to an instruction that I said. So I'd like to say this with an example. So suppose I'm blowing, um, I have a bubble bottle and I'm you know, blowing bubbles. So there is this little child, this toddler, maybe even a month, uh, a year old or 15 months, who's kind of clapping in excitement. He's watching the bubbles going. He's smiling. He's looking at me, he's smiling. They're sharing the same excitement. And as you see, there's no verbal communication, but there's a whole lot of communication that's happening between me and him. And this is what we call the, the, whole, the whole aspect of tuning in, of having an interaction between him and me, this is what we call the prerequisite learning skills. And this is the foundation on which his other skills of understanding language, expressing, speaking, his motor skills, his cognitive, this is what it builds on. So this, this rich foundation for language learning happens rapidly in the first year. So the first, the first word you only hear at 12 months. So before that, there's this whole load of skills that have to fall in place before a child starts to communicate. And um, so between nine to 15 months is very crucial, especially. So we're referring to pretext learning skills. And the terms that you often hear are joint attention, sustained attention, sitting, eye gaze, imitation, simple exploratory play. These are the prerequisite learning skills that a child needs to have in place before he learns to 
communicate or uh, when we start talking communication parents are largely talking about verbal expressive skills yeah so this thank you nirupama yeah so um, nirupama described the prerequisite learning skills this is an area that slps do not pay enough attention to you know we go directly into language and communication but what precedes communication skills is not something that we pay uh, adequate attention to and uh, our suggestion to both families as well as therapists is please ensure that these are in place because unless they are in place the child will not learn on his own like all of us do and that's the best way of learning uh, so do pay, pay attention to the prerequisite learning skills sitting joint attention uh you know being able to uh, share something with others uh, th this is a crucial part of uh, intervention our next panelist is dr milly matthew who will talk about the um, motor issues in children with autism spectrum disorders and emphasize gestural communication in particular because that is of more relevance to us again like many other things with children with autism spectrum disorders because they look beautiful they are lovely children nobody suspects that there is anything wrong with them and a routine medical examination does not pick up all of these issues that they are having in their developmental skills everybody thinks that the child has no motor issues but on examination you will find that they do have a lot of gross motor fine motor you know uh, skills which a lot of the occupational therapists and physiotherapists uh, deal with but they are also important for communication and this is what dr milly matthew our next panelist will talk about thank you ma'am so as as dr karant mentioned you know many infants and children with autism have delays in acquiring a lot of gross and fine motor skills um examples of gross motor skills are uh, like walking jumping throwing a ball engaging in play um and fine motor skills are you know um using the hands to hold a spoon to eat or stacking blocks tying a shoelace etc or even drawing um so these are often acquired as milestones um since the development of one skill aids in the development of the next one um however sometimes we see different patterns in children with autism so they could show delays in acquiring these skills but they could also show varied patterns in that um they may skip one milestone and they may demonstrate or acquire a higher skill and not show a lower skill um so so they somewhat um show unexpected patterns um and this brings me to gestures um particularly hand gestures which are motor behaviors that we use to communicate um so typically children start using gestures before they even start speaking words um some examples are like even what dr meera mentioned you know like pointing to something so if they point to a bottle um it could indicate that they are thirsty or they fold their hands and pretend to sleep to indicate that you know a, a doll is sleeping um or even just showing something showing a toy to the parent is even considered a gesture or giving giving a toy when when they are being asked to do so um and as they grow older some of these gestures do remain and some we and we acquire uh, children acquire different gestures and they show more adult like pattern um but what is known is that children with autism show delays in the development of and use of gestures um and just like motor development they might show even unexpected patterns um so for example they might start speaking in words before they even start using gestures so so that's very different from from what is considered a typical pattern now why are these important it's just because you know gestures and language development is so closely related um and as i just mentioned you know children often start using gestures before they speak these gestures are able to tell us as slps when a child is ready to to speak further like for example if i start observing a child using pointing at the age of 9 months i know in the next 3 or 4 months the child is ready to speak their first word so it's like it's it it can it can help us predict when the child is ready to speak um and gestures also help children interact initiate a conversation and establish joint attention like for example when a child 
um, just going back to my old example, when a child points to an object, they're sharing their experience with the parent and conveying a message to the parent. So essentially it helps us or it helps support social communication for that child. Thank you, uh, Millie. I'd just like to go back to Mira for a minute because uh, you know, we would also like to share how parents are partners. And uh, a lot of interventions these days are parent-mediated interventions because all of these aspects are done by parents in the family. And there's a partnership between the therapist and the parent. So Mira, if you can um, just you know, speak briefly about parent-mediated interventions, then we will go on to Lakshmi to sp uh, speak more specifically about speech per se. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so, like ma'am said, uh, parent-mediated interventions are really about training the parents to become co-interventionists or co-therapists. Um, and rightly so, right? Parents and caregivers spend the mo most of the time with the child. Well, the child spends most of its time with parents and caregivers. And so there are so many opportunities where they can teach the child skills that we have told the parents, right? So. Um, some of the things that we need to note are parent-mediated interventions is not just for the very young age, but it can happen across childhood and even uh, later on. We're basically telling the parents how they can help their child at home. Um, some of the things that we do when we, when we do when we say parent-mediated intervention is, first, we try and help the family understand what are the concerns, break it down, after which we kind of tell the parents that they must try, we show them how to do the how to conduct an activity, what are the skills to look out for, where do, they, where do they step back, where do they kind of connect with the child or where do they force the child to go one step ahead. So basically we break, it, break these skills down for the parents. Um, what we have found very effective and I think it's also the COVID time or it's just I think technology is advanced that several times families are willing to share those videos with us of how they are interacting with their children and so we can kind of actually sit with the parent side by side and go through the entire video and say, hey, this is a place where I thought you did a fantastic job. Here you could have, you know, pushed the child a little more. Maybe you didn't even give, a, give this child a chance to respond to you. You were too quick in providing the next instruction. So I think um, this is kind of video feedback or kind of modeling, video modeling that you, where you, this is one of the methods we use for parent mediated interventions where this is not possible, we keep parents on regular follow-up once in 15 days, once in a week, depending on logistics. And we tell families what to do. We demonstrate to them. Oftentimes we make the family do the activity right in front of us and provide them real-time feedback. So parent-mediated intervention is absolutely essential. And I think is the in many places, it's the way forward, especially in areas where intervention services are not there. We can, and there has been sufficient proof to show that parent-mediated interventions work. And that along with center-based intervention, I think would, would be the best for a child. Thank you, Mira. I would like to you know, draw your attention to what Bhuvana said. She joined the um, toddlers program, the pre-deal program that we do uh, at Comdeal. And she talked about what it meant to her to be involved okay, in the intervention and, and how that made things so much easier. So uh, increasingly, we do want families to be involved in the intervention. So particularly for the very young children, okay, the parent can play a very key role. Uh, I think we'll uh, have Nirupama elaborate a little bit more on speech stimulation uh, and how this can be done and then move on to speech production per se. Nirupama? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I'd like to go just a little one step back uh, where we, when we start working on the prerequisite learning skills, actually there's a whole lot of language stimulation that we are doing to the child. So like when, I, when you talk about the bubble activity, you're actually speaking so much as you're doing the activity. So while you are, while we are, request parents and ask them to focus on the prerequisite learning skills, it's, it's just, uh, it's, you know, it's default that the child's receptive language kind of moves up. So there is speech language stimulation because you're constantly talking to the child, you're using parallel talk, you're describing what he's doing, you're modeling, you're commenting on the activities that are happening around. So, but you're not expecting the child to react. The second thing is when we work on the prerequisite learning skills, you're also moving from the child's interest. So, you know, often parents ask us that when he doesn't even sit with me for, you know, 30 seconds, how do I even do any of these activities? How do I even talk to him? 
So I think that's why we need to remember that there is this child who's listening to us constantly. So when you take an activity that he really likes, that's where you make the breakthrough. And as you're doing the activity as speech language therapists, we train parents to keep talking to their child. So you're talking about the activities around, you're modeling, you're doing little imitation activities. And that's where all of the speech language stimulation just falls into place. You're not waiting for the child to respond. So we're still at, and that should not be, the child's response should not decide how much you speak to the child. So it's, it's just something that you would have done if the child had no delay. And I think with, under the guidance of a speech language pathologist who works with you know, these children, you'd be able to do really good speech language stimulation. So when you work on the prerequisite learning skills, it's not that you're not working on communication. It, it simultaneously, the receptive language does move up. Um, yeah. I, Thank you, Nirupama. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to the sizable nonverbal population that is there among those diagnosed with autism. If you look at the literature 20 years ago, the proportion was 60 to 40 with, the, or even 50-50, where 50 percent were nonverbal. But with early identification, early intervention, early support, a lot more children with autism are becoming verbal. But this doesn't mean that they do not have speech issues. There are still speech issues. And to talk about those issues, we have Dr. Lakshmi Venkatesh. Lakshmi? Yeah. So uh, as uh, Nirupama ma'am just said, uh, we do a lot of stimulation, language stimulation. We work on the prereq skills. And as we stimulate the child for language, after the prerequisite skills like joint attention, sitting tolerance, eye gaze, some of these skills are established. Children do start producing some speech as uh, Dr. Karan just said, children do start becoming verbal. So they do start producing some words, some sounds they start producing. And at this stage, it's very important that as parents, we reinforce and we acknowledge what they are producing. These early words and early sounds that children make are very, very important because it's very important for parents to respond and give meaning to these sounds. So in order for children to really do these words and sounds again and again, parents must respond and bring meaning and shape these early sounds and words, early sounds or words into more uh, words which make more sense to adults. So that is what, as a parent, we will do to improve speech production early on. And this it's very useful for parents to kind of make a list of all the sounds and the words that a child is making. This really helps us also as SLPs to kind of understand what sounds the child is producing. But despite all this, uh, there are some ch children who may have still continue to have very low sound repertoire. They continue to have very low uh, different, they don't produce all the sounds that are typically a two or a three-year-old child may make, in which case we need to really emphasize a lot on vocal play. So we pay additional information on vocal play and vocal play is just doing anything to make the child vocalize. So we, you know, parents could just do any activity to make sound effects, to make different kinds of sounds, insert any sound into a song, you know, such activities just to make the child make more sounds. These are things we would do with all children with um, autism to improve their sound production. But again, there are some more children who continue to have gross motor difficulties, oral motor difficulties, and continue to have poor sound repertoire, in which case, I think we need to add more support for them in terms of speech planning, programming, and in such cases, it may be useful for such children to work from, again, strengthening the motor uh, base in terms of gross motor imitation, fine motor imitation, and then moving to speech imitation and then trying to work on improving the sound repertoire and making them make more sound combination. So there are, uh, so in terms of identifying children with speech production deficits, we may get two sets of children. One set of children who may have very limited sound repertoire, in which case we build their repertoire and then build their speech production. 
the other set of children may start producing speech but they may be very unclear their speech may be unintelligible in which case also we may suspect that they have some speech uh, motor skill problem i'd like to just highlight one thing here that in autism what we must remember is that uh, children need practice for speech they need we need to work on speech motor skills but also work on motivation so it's very hard to kind of make out what is really causing their speech problem so simultaneously we should work on all three and that is why it's important to keep all the productions communicative and meaningful only then can we really move the children to voluntary speech production thank you lakshmi um, so we do know that there is a neural basis for the difficulties that children with autism uh, face and one of the crucial things in in a lot of these uh, communication disorders is the difference between voluntary production and involuntary production which is the key to what we call the apraxias and these apraxias can affect whole body movements brushing your teeth combing your hair or it can affect finer uh, motor uh, skills such as speech production uh, so this is an area that's coming up there's a lot more research to be done uh, i am sure a lot of you have seen uh, children with autism who suddenly come out with a perfectly formed sentence but then when they are asked to do it again they are totally unable to do it not because they do not want to do it but because they genuinely have difficulty in doing it and often again you know it, this is a recent documentation that these children have difficulties in feeding in in swallowing in chewing and they need help in those aspects too the oromotor skills and it's only when those are in place then the the even more finely coordinated speech production can occur so there is a, a stepwise input even there uh, among the verbal children too you know they they start speaking they learn communication but there are still oddities in their uh, communication they do not know how to modulate their communication with reference to whom they are speaking where they are speaking what are they speaking about and and we call these the pragmatic language skills so we have deepa batnayer who will talk about how to identify you know these uh, kinds of difficulties and how to address them deepa yeah so uh, these are also the higher language skills that i wanted to talk to you all about and i thought that i would give some case examples share some experiences that i've had in the recent past so one of the children that i would like to speak to you about is arya now arya is about 6 years old he does reasonably well in school he can follow complex instructions and is you know not too much of a trouble at school but when he comes home and if something has happened in school there is no way his mother has of understanding what may have happened at best at best he would say ananya has pushed me now what was it what led to it what was the consequence there is nothing that the mother can get out of him he has a difficulty with narration similarly i have and you know with in case of arya what happens is she has to ask him hundreds of questions before she will even begin to understand what might have happened so that is one of the kinds of difficulties with language at a higher level that some of these children have another child that i have worked with in the past is 14 year old tanmay now tanmay is constantly interrupting others if somebody if the speaker is asking a question even before the speaker can finish he is you know just shouted out some answer not even bothering to understand the speaker's point of view so to illustrate this further like supposing somebody asked him tanmay what did you do in the summer holidays so tanmay would say i love cook cooking now how is i love cooking related to the question that was asked it is pretty clear in tanmay's mind what he wants to say but the speaker is not able to understand what is it that tanmay is trying to say tanmay also has a monotonous kind of voice so this coupled with his different way of speaking makes him look a little weird and his classmates are a little wary of tanmay the one more example that i want to give you is of asha now asha is 10 years old we worked with her for about a year between 3 and a half to 4 and a half years old for her language difficulties after that she caught up and she's, she you know she was doing very well in school currently she is excelling in the classroom she is the teacher's pet 
uh, teachers just love her, but Arya has a problem. And that is the reason why the parents came back to us after a long gap. So Arya cannot stand losing. She understands that it is okay to lose and she cannot win all the time. But even then she says, I know I should not be upset, but I can't help being upset. She finds it very difficult to get her equilibrium back if she has lost or if she's not able to answer a question that the teacher has posed. In addition to this, Arya has difficulties with idioms and metaphors. If somebody said, oh, that baby is a total teddy bear, Arya will not understand what they're trying to say. Things like he went from the frying pan to the fire is something again, Arya will not, she, she takes language very literally. So she actually begins to imagine these kind of things happening. She finds it difficult to understand whether children are actually laughing with her or, or they're laughing at her. So she finds sarcasm and humor a little difficult to process. So these are some of the kind of difficulties that children have in addition to difficulties in taking turns, maintaining conversations, or understanding the main idea behind a story that they are listening to or reading. Thank you, Deepa, for uh, that uh, brief introduction to higher language skills, which can interfere with the quality of life of those with autism. Uh, many pa uh, there are questions that are coming from the audience talking about nonverbal communication, difference between speech and communication. Please remember that speech alone is not communication. Communication is larger. Uh, we spoke about gestures. We spoke about facial expressions. Uh, communication can happen in many ways. And uh, if I can draw your attention back to what the family said, for families, communication is extremely important. For individuals, communication is extremely important. So any form of communication is better than no communication. But of course, communication through speech is, is the uh, most accepted form, the easiest form once you master it. But it's also the more complex among them. So as I mentioned earlier, there are those who despite our best efforts, either because they have not received early identification, early intervention, or because they have genuine, you know, deep problems with uh, motor production, uh, have end up having a lot of speech difficulties despite intervention. These are the ones who remain nonverbal. Yet, we, we ought to provide them a means of communication. And uh, Dr. Preja Balan will speak about using uh, alternate modes of communication for those who are nonverbal. Preja? Yeah. So um, let me start with what is communication. I think we need to understand that first. Communication is a two-way process. So you have somebody who tries to communicate something and you have a partner there trying to understand what this person is trying to communicate. Now, when this communication cycle doesn't get com completed, you would call this a communication breakdown. Or you would also say that the child is not communicating. We could also look at a couple of other kinds of children with autism who actually speak speak. For example, there are children who would just repeat what is told to them, but they're actually not communicating. There are children who would come to us who could recite rhymes, who could sing songs, who could uh, say names of animals or say alphabets or numbers, but they're not actually communicating. So we have a group of children who do not communicate. And those are the children that come under the category of nonverbal communication uh, group. Now, um, how do we try to work with this nonverbal communication children? One, when we talk of nonverbal communication, we need to understand that these children tend to communicate in some way or the other. Just like how uh, Nirupama spoke about the child is trying to point to something and he's trying to indicate that he's hungry. So this pointing becomes a nonverbal form of communication. And we as adults in the environment need to understand that the child is trying to communicate but not use a verbal uh, marker to it. So one, as an adult, we need to respond to child's nonverbal communication strategies. So you would have another child who would just extend his hand to be carried. And as an adult, what you would try to do is expect a verbal output. But here, the child is actually trying to communicate by extending his hand. 
you need to encourage that nonverbal behavior and say, oh, you want me to carry you and let me carry you. So those opportunities, those early opportunities are moments that you need to capture, you need to interpret, you need to give meaning to it and associate, if you want, associate verbal output to it or associate other nonverbal strategies to it. When I say other nonverbal strategies, I would also say uh, one is the gestural system, just like how Mili mentioned, gestural systems begins very early during child development. The child is trying to indicate hunger by touching his face or touching his neck. The child is trying to indicate that he wants to listen to music by pointing to his ears. You need to appreciate these gestures, explore these gestures, and again, give meaning to it. There are children who would be using pictures for communication. For example, I look at the logo of say, uh, maybe a Cadbury, a chocolate paper, and I, I'm giving it to my mother to say, I need the chocolate. So the child is actually using pictures to indicate his needs. We need to explore these opportunities with the children so that they start using the symbol system for communication. These are the generic communication systems that we could explore when we are looking at children with nonverbal communication. There are other options currently available that we could look at. One, um, in this uh, era of technology, we have a lot of free apps that we could look at and we could explore them along with, I think a speech language pathologist and see what is the best suited option for this child. There are paid options available that again, you could look at and explore whether that kind of an option suits our need with the child. Thank you, Prija. There have been, uh, before we go to the training aspects uh, and uh, the knowledge and the beliefs of uh, both SLPs as well as the public at large, there are a few questions from uh, the uh, audience. Uh, there is a researcher from Cambridge University who's working on uh, communication in uh, uh, those with ASD. And her question is, uh, what we think SLPs should be doing, whether we should provide direct interventions or whether we should work on raising uh, awareness of autism and communication with teachers and the uh, public at large. I would like to say that speech therapists, speech pathologists need to be directly involved. Uh, and uh, I will give time for uh, Lakshmi Venkatesh to elaborate on uh, a praxis of speech a little more and how a speech therapist training can help address some of these issues. So there, you know, as already illustrated, there are many issues in communication, speech, language, and communication, which a speech therapist is trained in and uh, with the increasing awareness that the children have genuine difficulties in producing speech, in producing language, in producing communication, the speech pathologist can address those directly. Of course, we don't work in isolation. There's also the question of, you know, do we do this one-on-one? -on -one? All speech therapists, you know, believe that all speech therapy should be done one-on-one. -on -one. I, for one, do not agree with this because one of the reasons why we started uh, our program as a group intervention program was because the children that we had worked with earlier, we worked with them one-on-one, -on -one, children did well, they picked up with their families, they picked up with the therapist, and then we say, go enroll this child in a regular school, and the child feels dip, okay? He's unable to hold his own with his peers in a group. And, and that is a lot of therapy and the effort gone waste, unless the child can take those skills and use it in his daily life outside. Okay, there is no point because he's not going to live in a bubble. And that's when we get this notion of group intervention because under our guidance, the child learns to interact with peers who are his most difficult audience. And, and those are the uh, peers that he spends uh, a, a good amount of time every day. So when the child is able to hold his own with his peers, then he is ready to go out and learn on his own. Uh, so I do think that speech pathologists have a, a much more active role in intervention than educating the public uh, alone, because it, it's the specific training that the speech pathologist receives, which will help them address these uh, very many varied communication issues. Um, there is a, a, another question also about um, 
the you know impact of lack of early intervention and the question says if a child comes for you know or is identified late say after six is there no hope I would completely disagree with it, and I'm sure my co-panelists would disagree with it too. We have any number of instances of children who are reportedly, who have broken through their autism. What do we mean by breaking through this autism? Somehow the child's inner growth, okay? And I'm amazed at you know, how they manage this, how they keep their mental health and still learn to make use of their capabilities and then show how much they have absorbed, how much is going on internally within themselves, how much they've understood about what's going on around them. And often the speech and the communication has been a barrier. So there have been some with the uh, autism who have never spoken a word, but at age 14 would go and type sensible sentences, words, and talk about their inner world, what they've been watching, what they've been listening about. So please do not give up hope. Early intervention is extremely important, but it doesn't mean that if you have not had early identification and early intervention, everything is lost. There is still much that can be done. So please do not give up hope. Uh, so Lakshmi, maybe you can speak a little bit more about uh, apraxia of speech and how we would like to address that. And, and that's where the skills and training of a speech pathologist comes in. So uh, as I said before, I think we still are, uh, we don't understand uh, whether uh, the lack of speaking in children with autism is coming completely from speech motor skills or less practice of speaking or the entire, or just the motivation to speak. So I think it's important to work on all three. So uh, first thing I think we need to understand what are the sounds that the child can make. And NSLP will do a complete analysis of what sounds the child can produce. So this could just be sounds, this could be communicative sounds, it could be grunting sounds, it could be vocalization. So it's important for an SLP to get an idea of what are the nature of sounds that you can produce. What are the sound combinations the child can produce? So if it's just parents may say that child just produces pa, Ka, just the first syllable, just small, small parts of one syllable leaves out the rest of the word. So if the child produces only such chunks, then an SLP would help analyze this in detail and understand the repertoire of sounds and sound combinations that the child can make. This helps the SLP to really plan the core vocabulary that is needed for the child. So we identify a set of words, set of sounds that are communicative, and we would come down and narrow down and work with the parent and really understand and make a list of words, sounds that we think we can work on depending on the sounds that are already there. So it helps to start with the sounds that are already there. And so if the child says car, then we could build it to car, come, you know, other words like that. And we can go, uh, you know, pa, pu, pu, uh, we would expand the repertoire like this first with the sounds that are already there. And then we would increase the sound repertoire, which sounds that are not there and the combinations that are not there. So I think that for this, the parents really help us because they help us make a log, note down, record the child's speech, give us a good record, a repertoire of what the child can produce. So this is one step where we kind of identify what sounds, how to make the, identify the sounds and goal. Then the next thing is also about practice. So we want to give a lot of practice to the child. So when we make the child say these sounds and uh, different combinations and sound, rhythm helps, uh, melody helps. So putting these sounds in uh, singing tones, uh, rhythm helps, gestures help, doing it along with gesture. So obviously easily Tata said like this is easier than just Tata. So pairing the sounds and words with gestures help these children more and more. Pictures, doing it in unison along with the child helps initially to get these sounds. And just when we practice, I think, uh, I feel if we take out the pressure away, focus away from the face, it kind of helps. So using a lot of puppets, finger play, gestures, signs help. So if, instead of focusing too much on the mouth while we produce these sounds and sound combinations. So an SLP will help uh, deciding how to plan the sound sound combinations and give you ideas to just do more practice. 
and remember the whole thing has to be communicative it has to be meaningful if it is not meaningful and just uh, practice of uh, uh, opening the mouth and closing the mouth or just repeating a sound without any meaning the child is not likely to use it voluntarily and use it more communicatively so keeping it communicative and lot of practice and systematic practice will help in getting more newer sound and sound combinations thank you lakshmi ma'am can, can i just add a point there yes, yes. No. so um, i think one of the reasons for children again not communicating as lakshmi said um, apart from the processing issue and all is a social anxiety that most of our children in the spectrum face now when we apart from the drill aspect of um, uh, the drill aspect of speech production i would also say that a lot of apprehension a lot of um, anxiety gets reduced when you use a non verbal communication system also here so when you if you looking at a say voice output device or say a gestural system that eases a child's pressure to speak and it actually facilitates communication it actually facilitates more verbal output so i think that is one angle that parents should explore when they are looking at a child with apraxia or other processing disorders thank you preja there is one more question i think we will address before we move on to dr shivani tiwari uh, and this is about uh, predictability and uh, how um, families are being advised to keep things predictable but that the world is not really uh, that as predictable as we would like it to be Uh, and here i would like to invite uh, deepa batnayak to speak about parallel talk which is a technique that uh, initially was used for speech stimulation but we have used it extensively to connect with the non speaking child with autism spectrum disorders and it helps families and the child enormously uh, there are also now you know uh, a lot of uh, publications on mindfulness in a way this is being mindful about the child's difficulties in communicating and speaking for him and helping him to uh, you know not lock up everything within him so deepa would you please address that uh, briefly before we go on to other aspects deepa we don't hear you you're muted sorry yeah so parallel talk involves speaking on the child's behalf speaking whatever the child is thinking seeing feeling or experiencing so you know if if you are uh, if the child is if you watch the child looking at a crow for example oh mama look there's a crow i see the crow flying in the sky it looks so beautiful so if, wow crow so you know depending on what the child's interest are you may want to address on the child's behalf now this can be done at very very different levels because remember the child with autism understands much more than the child is able to show you either through communication or whether it be verbal or non verbal so the idea is to speak to the child at at the level at which you know all other children his age will understand uh, you know what is going on around them some of the examples of parallel talk where they have been really effective that i can give you is uh, one case where a mother wanted her child to participate on stage uh for a fashion show that the building uh, society was organizing so this child was about 9 years of age totally non verbal so she spoke to him and said it is important to me that you participate along with me all you have to do is walk on the stage hold my hand and walk on the stage so the child through his uh you know actions or whatever it became very clear that he was not very keen to go on the stage with her she again she, she spoke on the child's behalf mamma i am feeling so nervous i don't want to go on the stage everybody will be there there will be a lot of noise i don't like it then she again spoke you know on uh, her own behalf saying that i understand you are feeling nervous i will be there with you the entire time i'll be there to hold your hand if you don't like it at any point you can leave but i really would like you to try now it's surprising but the child at that time walked away with his grandmother to come back a little later and he actually walked on stage with the mother so it is this kind of talking to the child that helps the child to understand that he is understood there are options available to him that will enable the communication to get going sometimes when you know you are walking through a dark area for example you know the mother may say i am feeling scared this is so dark why are we here i don't want to be here anymore so speaking on the child's behalf in this fashion helps them to tune into their surroundings 
it also brings the language to the child so this is the ways in which parallel talk can be helpful to children thank you deepa uh, there are many questions you know uh, depending on what time is left to us at the end after shivani's presentation we'll address them here or we will address them through email or whatever you wish our next panelist is dr shivani tiwari along with her student she did a survey of the uh, knowledge base and the belief systems of slps who are working with children with asd this is extremely important given the complexity of the field given the history of the field uh, and we need to keep ourselves updated in terms of information this is important both for families as well as for uh, the larger discipline for families it's important because not all of us have been trained in these areas and it's obvious why so when you go to an slp ensure that this is somebody who has a genuine interest in 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 the area has experience has perhaps additional training and for the trainers we would like you know these to be incorporated uh, quite extensively in the training of slps because in the future we are pretty convinced that slps will indeed play a key role um, uh, in the management of uh, those with this asd so uh, dr shivani tiwari can i invite you to please uh, share the findings uh, on your survey yes thank you ma'am i hope you can hear me so thank you um, uh, for this opportunity uh, as uh, karan ma'am said the importance of uh, having studies on knowledge and belief uh, regarding autism uh, in professionals and uh, in uh, speech language pathologists particularly before i talk about the study uh, which we did um, let's see what knowledge is knowledge is basically the awareness and understanding regarding a subject we talk about autism today and uh, belief is a type of an attitude which refers to the acceptance or uh, trust faith Uh, or even confidence regarding uh, our uh, 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 regarding the knowledge we have related to autism it would be related to autism identification its causes characteristics uh, and intervention and prognosis so why do we need to uh, uh, study the knowledge and belief uh, regarding autism in speech language pathologists because these studies are important as ma'am rightly pointed out and more importantly it is needed to generate data to identify what are the gaps existing in the knowledge the cultural belief the attitude practices and these kind of uh, information or data will help us identify or guide what is the need uh, the problems existing the barriers which we can target in planning or implementing uh, intervention or a training program also such studies deepen our understanding of the information or attitude and uh, um, uh, uh, the factors which can influence our behavior so behavior particularly we talk with respect to our practice our uh, the way we deal with uh, children with autism and the families so also these studies uh, we uh, provide us the baseline data so if somebody wants to know um, uh, or uh, if i plan to conduct a training program for speech language pathologist i would like to know before the training how is the level of knowledge and belief in speech language pathologists and after conducting the training program i can reassess the knowledge and belief and i can actually uh, uh, measure the impact of the training program so in this context such studies are very important and uh, so with this background i would just briefly summarize the study which myself and my student uh, we did so myself and my student we did a, a survey on uh, speech language pathologist and our main aim was to identify or investigate the knowledge and belief of uh, speech language pathologists in terms of assessment and intervention of children with autism and we targeted speech language pathologists working in indian context so the survey was uh, prepared by uh, adapting uh, the known or popularly uh, knowledge and belief surveys existing um, and we took permission from the authors we adapted the survey and uh, we put it in a online uh, google form and uh, we took permission from uh, indian speech and hearing association and we uh, uh, shared the survey with all the speech language pathologists working in india 
and around 219 speech language pathologists participated in the survey and uh, <clears throat> the survey had three parts the first part had uh, information related to speech language pathologists education qualification their um, uh, the, uh, clinical exposure in clinical experience uh, the nature of work setting um, uh, and questions related to the caseload of children with autism and uh, the second section had statements and uh, you know, facts wherein the speech language pathologists were asked to uh, answer either true false uh, or uh, they were asked to uh, put whether they agree or disagree with those statements and those statements were checking the knowledge of the participants and third section similarly had uh, the statements which check their belief what do they think about different aspects of autism say for example the etiology the characteristic, the prognosis, the intervention, and so on. So the participants uh, who uh, were uh, there in the study had, uh, we had a range of participants varying in education qualification. We had a few uh, undergraduate uh, SLPs who had completed the undergraduate degree and some with uh, graduate. And uh, also we had few with uh, PhD uh, qualification and uh, they had varied clinical experience and uh, varied uh, caseload of children with autism. So that way we had a good combination of participants. They also worked in different work settings ranging from hospital, private clinics, schools, and uh, educational institutions. Uh, and a uh, few of the participants had undergone specialized training certificate programs like applied behavior analysis and a program offered by Comdeal. Uh, PEX, which is Picture Exchange Communication System, and Hainan's program. So participants uh, had undergone this specialized training. And uh, what we found uh, interestingly, how we assessed uh, their knowledge was, uh, we uh, compared their responses on the knowledge and belief with uh, responses from experts, five experts we collected. And uh, then we scored their uh, knowledge and belief uh, responses. And interestingly, the results uh, showed that uh, only uh, average, uh, only 43% uh, of speech language pathologists had average or good knowledge about autism and its attributes. And 27% uh, of speech language pathologists uh, showed uh, good or positive attitude uh, belief towards autism. And uh, surprisingly, um, while SLPs knew most of the characteristic or core features of autism, uh, they still had certain misconceptions regarding autism. For example, in the knowledge section, some, uh, some of the SLPs did not know that uh, children with autism uh, never make eye contact or they agreed or they, uh, they, they said that it is true that children with autism never make eye contact or uh, nearly half of the uh, participants didn't know or were not aware of the age at which the symptoms of autism usually or first manifest. So there were certain mis uh, misconceptions, not all, but few participants were not aware of it. Even uh, with respect to belief, we found that uh, uh, some uh, many SLPs had uh, uh, negative or uh, incorrect beliefs. Uh, for instance, we had a statement on um, autism occurred in higher socioeconomic and educational level participants. So uh, the SLPs uh, agreed to the statement. However, it was not supposed to be the case. So we found some interesting trends. So, and also when we looked into the factors influencing the knowledge and belief of uh, uh, participants, we found that all the important factors like their qualification, the duration of clinical experience, the caseload they have uh, had uh, with children with autism, um, uh, the, the nature of work setting, all these important factors influence their knowledge and belief. So the, the results have a clear uh, uh, direction or implication towards imparting or educating, uh, imparting knowledge and educating speech language pathologists to improve their knowledge and beliefs regarding autism, identification, assessment, and intervention. And uh, as rightly uh, find, uh, um, like uh, obvious from the results of the study, the factors like qualification, experience, caseload uh, gives us uh, uh, hints to the point that we can improve 
these uh, aspects, knowledge and belief by um, uh, improving our training to the uh, speech language pathology students in their undergraduate and graduate courses and uh, giving them ample opportunities to learn and uh, get update, uh, update their knowledge with the help of uh, workshops, conference, continued education programs, certificate course, like we have already offered by many of the institutions. And uh, definitely there is a, also a scope to modify the training program um, by prescribing required minimum number of clinical hours for the students or professionals, their case observations. Thank so, you, as, uh, Thank you. Uh, this is not to dishearten or you know discourage the public from uh, uh, accessing help from speech language pathologists, but it is a reflection of the state of art. And, and this is true of the larger discipline of autism, because if you, as I said, go to the internet, there are from voodoo and black magic, okay, to stem cell and uh, uh, homeopathy, there are all kinds of interventions that are advocated our advice to parents in the best interest of the children is check out whom you're going to. Yes, SLPs do have a very important role to play, but this is an evolving role. Okay, and as we go on, uh, this will become uh, uh, well established. Okay, there is a lot of research going on in this area. There's a lot of documentation going on. So, check it out and, and it is in the interest of the public that we share this knowledge, but it's also in our own interest to build our skills, okay? Because uh, understanding of a lot of these disorders is an ongoing practice. I've been working for 50 years. If I had relied only on what I learned when I left college, obviously I could not have you know, talked about what we've done or, or shown what we have done. So it is a growing process for us and and i think all of us are uh, together with in, in this uh, process i would like to answer a couple of issues that have been raised some of them are crucial uh, to the understanding of uh, autism spectrum disorders you must remember that we have focused largely on communication there are a host of other issues sensory issues motor issues uh, physical issues that are there with children with autism spectrum disorders, and you do need help from others also. We are not in any way advocating that you just go to an SLP and that is it. Okay, so the parent needs to be well informed, but just don't go and access uh, any and every website. There are websites which report on authenticated research publications. Okay, the website of the National Institute of Health, please access those kind of well-established websites and read up. Uh, don't read uh, any and everything that is out there on the internet. You will lose whatever confidence you have. So that kind of research, the kind of looking at where is the source of this information? Okay, how reliable is this information is important. Um, given that you know we don't have a whole lot of time, we may not be address may be able to address each of the questions that have been raised. Uh, I would like to take up the one on regression that has been posted. Uh, there is a question about you know uh, whether we see regression and what regression is all about. I, I just like to link it to what we said about the apraxia of speech. Okay, where a child is voluntarily you know, uh, producing something on his own, involuntarily when he's playing or when he's calm, he produces something. But when you ask him to say the same thing, he is unable to do it, okay? So there is this clear distinction between being able to do something on demand as against doing it on your own. And, and this is a crucial aspect of why you see variance in behavior. Now, uh, Earlier, in the, if you look at the literature earlier, there was so much uh, reporting of regression in children with autism where it was taken as a cardinal sign. If a child regressed, then he possibly has autism. Now with early identification and early intervention, the reporting of regression has come down. Because if you identify early and if you give a nurturing environment to the child, the child won't regress. So the interpretation of regression is there is too much pressure on the child. 
Okay, and that is when he stops doing what he is already learned and is capable of doing. Okay, so I would suggest explore what is happening. Where is the pressure? Remove the pressure. Let him do it at his own time, at his own speed, and encourage that and enhance it. The child will do more and more of it. This is true of normal language learning. If you keep correcting a young child when he is learning something, every time he utters something, he will never learn to speak. What do we typically do? We go Google over every utterance of a child. A parent, you know, uh, repeats it 10 times, talks about it and says how well the child is doing. And that's what helps the child go forward. And children with autism spectrum disorders also require this. Okay, they are no different from other children. Uh, so, you know, the literature also will show that there are changes in some of these as we get better in identification, in intervention. Uh, there is also a and question it's about... Just, the, it's just one moment. So that, and it's also known that there is a subgroup of children with, on the spectrum who have regression. And it's believed now that it's a part of the symptomatology. It's like anything else, like they don't point or they don't gesture enough. So that's a very small group. But this, this aspect requires enormous history taking and really like tapping into a lot of other details. I just thought I should let kind sure. of add yeah. that to your Yeah. Uh, there is also this uh, uh, other issue, I think, that uh, 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 people have asked about differential diagnosis between hearing impairment and uh, autism. That too, you know, there was a lot of it earlier. You see it coming down. A lot of children with autism spectrum disorders are suspected of having hearing impairment. We won't go into the details uh, here because we are already at 840. Uh, but I would like to emphasize one aspect of the interaction between us and the families where I think for years together, we've dismissed what parents have said. And, and, and I think this is uh, not acceptable, particularly for children with autism spectrum disorders. The parents are the ones who see the best and the worst of the child. And it is important for clinicians to pay heed to what the parent is saying. Okay, and a lot of the time, the parents would have seen the child at his or her best also, not only at his or her worst. And we need to take both those aspects into consideration careful history taking, careful cross checking, careful observation, and then you can come at a, a clear understanding. It's not the quantitative tests alone. We have not reached that stage. So it is a mixture of the quantitative physical tests as well as the qualitative reports that come from families, from parents, which will help us both in diagnosis and uh, increasing the impact of intervention. Uh, so I think uh, we are open to more questions, but given that we are at 8.42, I will hand over uh, the mic to the organizers. I, I think we'll let you take it uh, further from here. But we are available. All of us, I'm sure, in the panel will be happy to respond to queries either through Isha or through email or whatever that you know Isha would like to uh, share with you all. So don't feel that this is the end of our interaction. We are very open to continuing interaction with families, with young SLPs, uh, with whoever wants to you know, be involved in the identification and management of uh, communication disorders in children with autism spectrum disorders. So Meenakshi, I think I'll let you uh, take over from here. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I will request uh, Garima. She's kind of no, QA moderator. So, Garima? Yes, ma'am. Uh, there are a lot of questions, actually. Ma'am, yes, thank ma you so much. It's really generated a lot of interest, good interest. I feel uh, we have a uh, mixed group here. So, Garima, you can take over from here. And then, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. There are a lot of questions which has already I've put it in chat box and madam has answered. I'll take up one more question. This is for uh, Ms. Deepa. Is there any scale available for reference to which higher language skills is expected according to the age range for SLPs? Ma'am? Deepa, I think that in the chat box. A good starting point would be the Manipal manual for adolescent language. But at the same time, uh, there are there could be many children many individuals who would do well on this still have communication difficulties in such scenarios we look at communication profiling 
So we collect data from very many different sources. Like you uh, talk to the parents, talk to the child, observe the child and peer interaction, uh, look at the narrative skills, look at the conversational skills and use this to build up a profile of the child, which would then be the basis for intervention planning. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am, there's another question. This is for you only. Uh, I would love to know about this will help in higher communication. My son is eight and a half years old. And oh, you've already answered that. I've answered that. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Done, ma'am. We'll, we'll take another one. Meanwhile, I can pose a question from YouTube. Yeah, ma'am, there was a question that how do we draw a line when we have to suggest for adjunction strategy, uh, like uh, body coordination and praxis if it is influencing? Um, can you repeat that question? The uh, uh, body praxis, right? Yeah. Y yes, ma'am. Uh, we do know that children with the autism not all of them, but several of them have difficulty in even gross motor imitation. Okay, sim something as simple as lift your hand, left, right, the body versus the external world. Okay, they do have a lot of issues with this. And that is where uh, not only do both occupational therapists and speech, uh, physiotherapists play a role, but the use of dance, drama, um, music with these children helps in uh, getting them to participate in these motor activities. So there are genuine difficulties with motor dif uh, issues, motor imitation. It could be gross, it could be fine, it could be oromotor. And uh, there are scales that are available to evaluate these. Uh, generally, as I uh, said earlier, managed by occupational therapists and physiotherapists, uh, but as we work together as teams, we have had the very positive experience of speech therapists doing some of this as they do their speech exercises, occupational therapists doing the right kind of speech stimulation when they are doing occupational therapy. So teamwork enables all of us to learn from each other, maximize the use of the time of the child and the therapist. I hope that answers. Yeah. Okay. I would like Thank to add something here. Garima, yes, I think um, we need to understand that there is nothing called as first we will address a particular component of the concern and then take the next component. I think we need to look at the child as a whole and then pick up all those components that put the symptoms, I mean, uh, put all the symptoms together and see what contributes in what way and start addressing that. I think that would also answer that question to an extent. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Um, there's one more question which has come from YouTube. Uh, can you please address the pronoun swap issue with verbal children? Pronoun? Pronoun swap yes. issue oh, yeah. okay. with verbal now, children. That was uh, the incorrect use of pronouns, particularly the I and the U, has been uh, uh, long documented in uh, uh, children with autism. In fact, one of my first papers in 1970-71 was on pronoun usage in children with autism. And at that time, of course, you know, within the psychiatric uh, psychological disorder interpretation, it was interpreted as the child, you know, not being able to separate his ego from the other and therefore had difficulty in pronoun usage. But in terms of understanding language acquisition and the use of these, uh, it is linked to the child's notion of his or her own body as against the external world, okay? And the other in the external world. Even typically growing children go through a period of confusion. I and you, left and right, front and behind, okay? This is only when the child's understanding of his body vis-a-vis -vis the external world crystallizes in his mind that he is able to use these words correctly, okay? And we do know that children with autism spectrum disorders also have difficulty in terms of spatial orientation, body versus external space, up, down, okay? Because their sensory processing and their motor feedback is different from the typical. So it's linked to that. 
Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Minakshi, ma'am, over to you. So uh, there is another question. Uh, this is regarding how early we can suspect or detect a child with congenital hard of hearing might have ASD. And should we wait for the intervention, uh, the hearing intervention, or we should go ahead and, or first we should do ASD intervention and then move towards hearing intervention? That's a, a very tricky question. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest don't wait. Speech stimulation, whether it's for a hearing impaired child or whether it is for a child with autism, is needed irrespective of you know what the condition is. But of course, you need to do the additional tests and the fitting and all of that if it's a hearing impairment. Yeah, because we don't physically intervene with a child with autism spectrum disorders. So I would suggest that get that clearance first. And, and there are many ways of detecting a, a hearing impairment, more physical ways than in identifying an autism spectrum disorder. Right. So rule that out and and then provide the speech stimulation irrespective of what the condition is. Ma'am, uh, like these days, uh, the implantations and, and the... Uh, they are happening early, as early as possible is what we are saying. And sometimes we detect with the, the autism you know, later after that. And sometimes we have uh, issues with sensory integration of these children. So are there any special suggestions on that? A special okay. suggestion would be that audiologists have to be very careful before they just, you know, advocate implantation. I've had this issue. I've had personal experiences of children being fitted with hearing aids okay, and being treated as hearing impaired children when they really had autism. And a lot of the time, if you talk to the mother, you know, he would say, no, he hears. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know he hears because he responds to this, this and this. Okay, one of the earliest children that I saw was uh, uh, where the mother was totally convinced that the child would hear, but then they were very good family friends with a very well-known uh, ENT surgeon. But, you know, he was fitted with a hearing aid and he went around with the, with the hearing aid till he was four or five years old. Okay, but then the, it became very clear that one, he could hear, and second, the autism, other symptoms of autism came up. So it is a tricky area, but I think, and this is where, again, I would say, go back to the family. Don't mm -hmm. discard what the family is saying, particularly the immediate family. And I think the mother is, is crucial. Right. Yes, ma'am. So, Thank you, ma'am. of both are critical for intervention, as you said. Ma'am, there's one question for Dr. Meera. Yeah. How can we measure social interaction in children with ASD? Is that for Mira or Deepa? <laughs> I mean, I think it depends upon across. I mean, I think all of us can answer depending on what age we are looking at. But Deepa, ma'am, do you want to take it? Okay, Mira, go ahead. We're waiting for you, Mira. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, I think I think Deepa, ma'am, will do better justice, ma'am. So. Because she said, Meera, I start jumped in, but go ahead, Deepa, ma'am. It's okay. Could you, so what is the question again? Can you ma'am, the, the question, question, question was, how can we measure social interaction in children with ASD? Yeah, so, with respect, yeah, so with respect to higher language, like I said earlier, it's largely profiling because we don't really have the scales in India where we can measure some of these issues. So what we need to do is, I mean, in fact, across, are you able to hear me? Yes. Are you able to hear me? Yes, Deepa. Yes, ma'am. So we don't really have, you know, uh, standardized scales as such with which we can, which, with which we can measure some of these high language issues. So we really need to look at profiling. There is some work that has been done by Winner, for example, uh, Michelle Garcia winner who has given some uh, frameworks for interview which can be utilized with, with which we can get an idea as to what are the areas in which the child or the individual is having issues. Use that to make the basis for the intervention planning. Can I just uh, add a little more there? See, earlier um, uh, tools such as the VSMS, the Vineland Social Maturity Scale, were used and, and they would pick up the social uh, lags in these children. Of course, they are not very culture friendly, but there are uh, uh, a lot more tools such as the social quotient, 
uh, which assesses children. Uh, we are working on an adapted Indian version at Comdale on this. They do pick up the social lags in the children. Our Comdale profile also picks up uh, social lags in children quite clearly. And, and we see that uh, the triad being reflected in the composite profiles that we assess. The CDDZ does have a component on social skills normed on Indian children. It very clearly picks out social lags up to the age of six. Beyond that, we are looking at the social question, uh, quotient uh, tools. Mira, do you want to add to that? No, ma'am, uh, nothing much, but just that in the West, they use the ADOS for social communication and interaction, but I, I'm not saying that we have that ability here in India. But I agree with what Deepa Ma'am says that it's, I think, more of profiling and we'll have to really suit it to the cultural context and measure social interaction. Okay. Ma'am, there was one question from a parent that about this policies and all Indian government is putting ASD into the uh, insurance part. So uh, they sometimes say that you have to go to a government organization and get the test done. Then only it will be valid, not from private uh, institutes. So what is your say on this? Uh, I think we have uh, a long uh, uh, way to go in this aspect. It has not happened elsewhere in the world either. Okay, SLPs are the newest entrants, but I'm sure that this will happen. In uh, the West, the issue of insurance is taken very seriously because all of these therapies are long-term, expensive, and parents cannot afford to pay for it. So insurance is a crucial issue there, and there is a lot of legal uh, uh, battles that are going on about this. But, but there is also a, a well-established system there where it is covered. Okay, in India, unfortunately, it has not happened, okay, not just for communication, but the broader aspect of the well-being of the child with autism and the support for the family is just not there. Okay, so this is something that the larger uh, uh, advocacy groups should take up. And I think as we go on, SLPs should claim a part in that because it will crystallize these communication disorders that are there, that they are very genuine disorders, that something can be done about it will crystallize. And I think we do have a clear role to play in diagnosis and intervention and certification. But it, it's organizations like ISHA which need to take this forward. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for that. Uh, yes, ma'am. And actually, ma'am, over to you. We don't have any more questions from my end. Thank you. Actually, we have a few more, but then I think looking at the time constraint, it was such such a wonderful uh, panel, so interactive and thoroughly from parents' perspective. And I'm sure many, many parents would have you know, got uh, the questions answered. They would have many more. Of course, they can always reach us uh, um, at later time. But yeah, ma'am, the message was very clear. Early intervention is the key. And I would like to thank uh, Pratibha Karan, ma'am. Ma'am, you really took it to the next level. And all the panelists for giving your input in various aspects. You covered so much in this two hours. Probably it would help a lot of us. Uh, oh, Naika, sir, over to you for the closing remarks. Good evening, all of you. Uh, indeed, I agree with uh, what Minaxi said. For many of us, each known facts about autism also have many unknown parallels. I'm happy to say that today's session has given us some in-depth understanding and has kindled our interest to explore more about autism. It was an excellent discussion to listen and it was very engaging. They have aired their views on the diagnosis, management of communication impairment and uh, schooling in children with autism. It was a clear message on early identification and intervention. The panelists further stressed the vital role played by a speech language pathologist right from pointing to use of gestures, to being able to understand the situation and communicate, a speech language pathologist can help. In crux in autism, it is easier the better. More than my pleasure, it is my privilege to thank the moderator for the day, Dr. Pratibha Karan, a pioneer in the field, for being with us and making the session more, both interesting and enriching. My special thanks to our eminent panelists, 
Dr. Frieza, Dr. Vipa, Dr. Mira, Dr. Milly Matthew, Dr. Shivani, Dr. Nirupama, and Dr. Lakshmi Vintage for enlightening us and enhancing our understanding. And Mrs. Garima for her help. Finally, I leave you this inspiring quote by Dr. O.I. Lovas. If they cannot learn the way we teach, we teach the way they learn. I thank you all and good night. Thank you and good night. Thank, thank you. Before, yeah, thank you, one and all. Ma'am, before we go, just before, just this thing that we have a very interesting panel tomorrow on uh, genetics, the role of heredity in various uh, our speech, language, communication disorders, um, whether it's uh, autism or it's uh, fluency, hearing loss, they'll be covering a lot. So it would be really, uh, you know, we, we request you all to join us tomorrow as well. Thank you so much, one and all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you and good night. Good night. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Minam. Thank you, all of you. And special thanks to all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good night. Good night. And thanks to all our sponsors who helped us organize this evening.